Hello, my name is Marla and I'm so happy you're joining me for a video teaching going along with my blog posts over at the website in jesusname.net. You can feel absolutely free to jump on in, subscribe over there, it's free and you'll get all the videos and the blog posts sent directly to you as I'm teaching through the Bible cover to cover. And for today's video, you picked a great time to join because what I'm going to do is do a little summary of what we've been doing all along as far as learning the story of Scripture. That's been one of our goals for this Bible study, uh, to be able to share the story of Scripture, what we're calling the scarlet yarn, which, which runs right through every single book of the Bible and points right to Jesus. Now, where we are in our Bible study is towards the end of the Old Testament. So I thought it would be a really good time to just recap everything here in video so you can play it over again and be able to practice this story of Scripture because it is a powerful witnessing tool when you can show people that there is indeed one common story running through all these different 66 books of the Bible with 40 different authors, authors which have been written over thousands of years. So we started this all by learning a little song which was 512 5512 41211. 512 5512 41211. And where we are in our Bible study is that last 12, which points to the 12 books of the Minor Prophets. We're right towards the end, and so pretty soon we're going to be wrapping that up the Old Testament and moving into the New Testament. So this is your time to practice what you've learned so far through the uh, creation story, through the books of the Torah, through the history, and through the poetry, and now through the prophets. We want to be able to share this with people, the story of Scripture. So I'm going to start at the beginning with um, the book of Genesis, and I'm going to talk us through right to where we are right now before we get into the New Testament, which is obviously where we meet the Jesus himself in, in flesh and blood, um, that the scarlet yarn ending, you know, with Jesus and his life. So let's talk it out, okay? Let's speak it out, and then you have to promise <laughs> to replay this so you can talk it out too, all right? So it all starts in the beginning when God created everything. And he did that in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Now on the sixth of those days, God created man and he placed man in a garden and he made him out of the dirt and part of what he gave to man was the ability to name every single animal that he created and along the naming process man was unable to find an animal a beast that was suitable as a partner to him and so God put man into a deep sleep and out of his side he took a rib and he created woman. And these two lived in the Garden of Eden. Now there was one instruction given to man and that instruction was that there was a tree in the garden that they uh, were not to eat of the fruit of. And we see in chapter 3 of Genesis that a serpent, a walking, talking serpent, which is just scary, uh, tricks the woman into eating from this tree. This tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent says that the reason why God is holding back on allowing them to eat of this tree is that God doesn't want them to have the knowledge of good and evil like he has. Well, he twists the word of God and, and the woman, she eats of the fruit. And immediately um, she shares the fruit with her husband, the man whose name is Adam. And the both of them, though they had been naked and unashamed in the garden to this point, immediately they recognize their shame. They make uh, coverings out of fig leaves and they cover themselves to try to cover their shame. They hide and God comes looking for them in the garden and asking, where are you? Well, when they, they come out, they, God obviously knows what they have done and they start blaming each other and so God places curses on the woman, well, first on the snake, then on the woman, then on the man. And um, meanwhile, he gives the first little inkling of the way that this whole thing is going to be rectified, that all of a sudden now this evil has come to the world. Um, he states what's called the Proto-Evangelium, which says that from the seed of a woman, one is going to come that is going to crush the head of the serpent. And even though the serpent is going to strike the heel of that seed, um, the seed will eventually crush, crush the head of the serpent. So that is the first little 
foreshadow a little taste that we have that that this somebody is coming to crush the evil the, that that the serpent has placed on the world and so that's that's our beginning glimmer now right after this god kills an animal and he covers the man and the woman with the skin which is the first time that we see that there's the shedding of blood to cover the the sin the guilt and shame that has come up upon upon mankind for disobeying god the man and the woman are cast out of the garden and from there they have children they have two sons and the two sons wind up one son winds up killing another son so we see that mankind is now become wicked and already killing has happened before this there was no killing on earth and so um cain kills abel and then from there wickedness just spreads on the earth and we get to the point where right before uh, the time of Noah, wickedness is so rampant on earth that God decides that he is going to press the restart button on earth and wipe out everybody except for one family line, which is the line of Noah. He gives Noah some warning and they build, and Noah builds an ark and he and his family are spared on this ark and all of the rest of the earth is wiped out. Noah and the family emerge from the ark and they are given the directive to go and populate the earth and hopefully everything is going to go well this time. But unfortunately, the um, family of Noah becomes into you know great nations of people. They march out and when they get to a certain place called the Plain of Shinar, they decide to build a tower to make themselves great, to reach up to the heavens, to be like God. And so God at that moment frustrates the language of the people so that they can't communicate with each other and continue to build this high tower and thereby God gets what he wants the nation spread across the earth all different languages and then when we get into uh, Genesis 12 things get very very narrow and focus in on one man out of one of these nations his name is Abram and he comes from Ur of the Chaldeans and God focuses in on this man and gives him the directive to leave his leave his homeland and go to a promised land that God will give to him eventually and Abram is eventually given the name Abraham and God gives Abraham a covenant, which is called the Abrahamic Covenant. It's unconditional, which says that out of Abraham's line, a great nation is going to be formed. And out of this great nation, there is going to be a blessing for the entire earth. And to this nation, God is going to give a promised land. And that's the Abrahamic Covenant, which, as I said, is unconditional, which means it's only up to God to fulfill that covenant. So the rest of the book of Genesis really focuses in on the line of Abraham and how it how it goes from generation to generation, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And then towards the end of the book of Genesis, everything really focuses in on one of the sons from the line of Jacob. Uh, Jacob's name gets turned to Israel, and that man Israel has 12 different sons, and everything in Genesis focuses in on one son. His name is Joseph. And we see that Joseph gets taken away into captivity into Egypt by the um, evilness of his brothers. And there in captivity in Egypt, Joseph rises to power and he winds up um, saving his whole family, which is back in the land of Canaan. And um, with that, all of the family of Israel comes down to Egypt. They are safe because of Joseph rising to power in Egypt. And that is where the book of Genesis closes. When we open up the book of, of Exodus, which is the next book of the Bible, we see that the nation of Israel has grown to a great and mighty nation, millions strong. And so we see that the beginning of this Abrahamic covenant has already come to pass, that God has made Abraham's line into a great nation. And now they're in Egypt. And what God is going to do next is call out a deliverer to come and save the, the nation of Israel from bondage in the nation of Egypt. That deliverer's name is Moses, and this is where we have the great story of the Exodus, where Moses is told to go to Pharaoh and give him a bunch of different warnings, ending up with the last warning, which is um, you must uh, paint on your doorpost a, a the blood of a lamb, and in that way God will pass over you and not kill anybody inside, but everybody else who's inside the home who has not painted the blood of the lamb on the doorpost will be executed. That is the last and final plague, the plague of the firstborn, which is 
uh, given to Pharaoh by Moses. And so this is where we get Passover today. It is that shedding of blood of a lamb so that the angel of death, death would pass over and nobody in the home, none of the firstborn in the home would be killed. And so the people of Israel do this and finally Pharaoh lets them go free. And so Moses delivers the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt and they go into the wilderness heading towards the promised land. So now you have this great big nation uh, in the wilderness, the nation of Israel, but in order for there to be a nation, there needs to be laws. And so Moses gets a bunch of laws from God and they these laws are called the Mosaic Covenant. So God says to the people that he would like to dwell among them and he would like for them to be holy, meaning he wants them to look different from all the different pagan nations so that perhaps all the pagan nations are going to come to know the one true God through them. The people of Israel have no idea how it is to follow one God because they've been in the pagan land of Egypt all this time. So God is going to give them a bunch of laws which they are to follow so that they can become holy, so that he can dwell among them, and so the other nations can see there's a difference with people that follow God. And again, this is called the Mosaic Covenant, and this is a conditional covenant. The covenant says, if you follow these laws, then you will get into the promised land and stay there. And so we see um, this is all given out. The people of Israel agree. And so God comes and dwells among them. He lives in a, temp, a, a tabernacle, which is a temporary kind of a, a temple, which moves along with the people in the wilderness until the point where they cross over into the promised land. Now, part of all these laws is found in the book of Leviticus is a sacrificial system which sets up a system of sacrifice. Shedding of blood for remission of sins. It's a temporary thing that the Israelites are given so that God can continue to dwell among them. Something that they can do to cleanse themselves so that God can be in their midst while they're traveling through the wilderness and into the promised land. And so that's the book of Leviticus. And then one thing in the book of Deuteronomy that you need to hear um, in Deuteronomy says that in uh, if the people follow the, the laws of Moses, then they will stay in the promised land. And if they don't, then they will be cursed. And as part of that, they will be kicked out of the promised land. And so in Deuteronomy 28, we see that, and that's something that carries over into the rest of really the history of Israel. They just begin to live that whole thing out because as they get into the promised land, they take over all the different areas that God had promised them. And um, they, they are led in there by a man named Joshua. We see that in his book, the book of Joshua. And then as soon as Joshua dies and all the people kind of associated with Joshua dies, the people start to disobey God. And so God starts to bring a set of people, judges their call to try to steer the people of Israel back towards him. It doesn't work. They, they become wicked. And eventually the people of Israel call, cry out for a king because they see all the pagan nations have a king and they want one too. And so they cry out for a king. God allows this king named Saul to rise up, but he's not God's anointed king. And so he doesn't do very well. And then God sends King David, his anointed king, to be the shepherd of the people of Israel. David is known as a man after God's own heart. And to David, God gives what's called the Davidic covenant. This is another unconditional covenant. And so we see this thread line going to Jesus really starting to take form in the fact that to, in the Davidic covenant, God says that he will um, make David an eternal throne in Jerusalem, that somebody from David's line is going to be on that throne forever, and that um, it's his line, the line of Judah, that is going to um, be in power with somebody on the throne for, forever um, in Jerusalem from David's line. And so that's the Davidic covenant. Again, this is an unconditional covenant. And so God is going to get this done no matter what. Now, unfortunately, when David dies, his son, whose name is Solomon, takes over. So indeed, God has taken care of one part of that covenant, that, that there's somebody who's following David. But Solomon is not a, a good king in the way that David was. And so right after Solomon dies, the nation of Israel, which is one nation living in the, whole, the promised land, it divides into two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is just ruled by wicked king after wicked king after wicked king. 
The southern nation of Judah is ruled by kings after the line of David. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but on the whole, they are also wicked as well. And so what we see is the northern kingdom of Israel, conquered by Assyria in 722 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah, conquered by Babylon in 586 BC. And so we have this section of the history of Israel where the prophets are speaking. The prophets are speaking before the captivity of Assyria and Babylon, during, after, trying to warn the people of Israel of what is coming and trying to tell them to turn back. Now, in the meanwhile, before the books of the prophets, there's a book of, the, of poetry, five books, book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then we have Ecclesiastes, um, the Song of Solomon, and um, Proverbs. And all of those books are poetry, and they all give us sort of a flavor and a feel of what it's like to be a person living within the times of, of the kings, basically. So we have King David who wrote the Psalms, we have uh, King Solomon who wrote the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs. Um, and um, in that way, we get a little flavor of what it's like to be a person in the time of the kings. Uh, we also got some books like um, Ruth and we got some books of um, uh, Esther and we get little personal stories along the way of what it's like to be living during these times that I was just discussing. But now here we are in the book of the prophets and uh, the cry out has gone by every single prophet to turn, relent, repent, turn back to God because what has happened, uh, what God said was going to happen, Deuteronomy 28 has now happened. They have turned from God and because of that, Israel has gone into captivity. And so um, that is what the prophets are doing. They're just crying out. Now we do get a little glimmer of hope found within the books of the prophets. And that is what's called the new covenant, which is given to Israel. And the new covenant says that there's going to be a day when the Mosaic covenant, that conditional covenant that, that hinged, um, if you do this, then you'll get the promised land. That old covenant is going to be cast aside and a new covenant that is going to come where God is going to write his law on people's hearts and he's going to pour out his spirit on them. And so that new covenant is what is coming. And of course, we know that that new covenant is fulfilled in Jesus's blood on the cross. But the setup is all within the books of the prophets, which is where we're in. We also get in the books of prophets all kinds of hope for a future time when Israel is going to be gathered back into the promised land. Right now, they're out there, uh, uh, spread out among the nations in captivity, but in the future, they're going to be gathered back. And in the prophets, we see all kinds of glimmers of what's called the millennial kingdom, where God is going to reign, Jesus is going to reign from a rebuilt temple in this millennial kingdom from Jerusalem, and everybody on earth is going to be a God follower. And all of Israel is going to be collected together there again uh, from their captivity. And so this is the hope that we see in the books of the prophets, even though they're always talking about the, you know, the catastrophe that's coming to Israel. There's hope for the future. And that is what we're going to see played out as we get into the New Testament and into the book of Revelation, uh, the hope that's going to come in Jesus. Okay, so I hope that that helps you to share the story of Scripture very succinctly, just what is going on and how we're following a storyline into the New Testament when Jesus shows up and then carries out the rest of the New Testament promises, which are to write his law in our hearts and, and pour out his spirit upon all the earth. All right, so practice, 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 practice your story of scripture. Tell people about the Bible and how it's not confusing. It's all one big story that points right to Jesus. All right, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. It's in Jesus' name we're doing it all. Go to the website and subscribe in jesusname.net and I'll see you next time. Bye now.